Bill Lebeau's 1972 Sociolinguistic Patterns, which lays out many of the tenets that became foundational to sociolinguistics, variationist sociolinguistics, and modern dialectology, and linguistics more broadly, establishes as one of the guiding principles the principle of accountability. Accountability here refers to our accountability to the data and most narrowly refers to our obligation to report the totality of what occurs for a variable. Throughout most of this book, Lebov is positioning his approach to variation as sociolinguistics against Chomskyan linguists uh, who would meditate on their own grammatical structures and phonological structures and then use these to generalize about the human linguistic capacity. That would certainly apply here as Lebov raises the principle of accountability. Lebov would want, rather than a linguist questioning their own tuitions about whether they could use a form uh, which would cause that linguist to settle on a single form as being the one that constituted the core aspect of their grammar, Lebov would want uh, a broad collection of real language uh, sampled and then analyzed. But more narrowly, Lebov in his Principle of Accountability is also raising a challenge against qualitative linguistic methods uh, that were being developed and would be developed, and I think about the tradition of dialectology, which looked to isolate a single kind of feature that was of interest to the dialectologists who were trying to study an area and determining binarily whether or not that, a fe that feature occurred in that particular area. For example, in traditional dialectology, as we know from the survey of English dialects, a researcher might be interested in whether or not uh, people described a river as being full of water and out of its banks as being in flood. This would be treating linguistic variation, lexical variation in this case, uh, binarily as if in flood were a variable that was either produced in an area or not. Actually, we know rationally and specifically from Survey of English dialect records, since the methodology there uh, allowed uh, informants to give free responses, so we got many, many uh, variables, many, many productions on lexical, and phonological, and phonetic items, uh, including in flood, where we get in flood, flooded, of a flood, of a flown, and many others, just in the West Midlands. Uh, and just in Warwickshire specifically, um, we know that that kind of treatment of a variable as being one thing that either people do or people don't do as being incorrect. In fact, what Lebov is really repositioning variability as is that any given instance that we want to research, anything, any feature that we want to isolate whether or not people say, that's actually not a variable, but a variant. One variant that exists within a variable that can have several variants that occur uh, and are actually different realizations of the same feature, whether that feature is phonetic, phonological, morphosyntactic, semantic, or pragmatic, uh, or discourse uh, based. Um, and that actually, to be accountable for our data, what we need to do is to properly encapsulate what that variable is, account for each variant that occurs, and then quantify each of those variants as an overall proportion of the variable. If we do that, then we're actually being accountable for our data, and we can come to something more like a realistic picture of the linguistic variability that exists in a place. So the summed up, boiled down version of the principle of accountability is that rather than researching a feature, what we must do as dialectologists, as variationists, as sociolinguists, or as linguists, is determine what the range of variance is that constitutes a variable. Then we have to account for the occurrence of each variant and quantify that against the overall pool of variants within that variable. And then only by going through that full process of tracking each variant uh, as an occurrence in a cloud of variables can we accurately account for linguistic 
variability and accurately describe the dialectology in the area or the sociolinguistic realities uh, of a dialect or language variety that we're interested in. So the fundamental principle of the principle of accountability is that we have to determine what the range of variation is within a variable and then account for all of that. That means we have to account for the times where the feature of interest to us does occur, and we also have to account for the times when the feature that we're interested in doesn't occur, whether that means that it occurs as a different variant or whether that means a speaker opts not to use that feature at all or perhaps any other feature. So this is the core principle of the principle of accountability. A second part of that is that in our assessment of the overall variability within a variable, we have to analyze where variation is occurring in identical ways uh, or similar ways, in other words, following the same set of rules and patterns, and where actually uh, members within that variable class are doing something different. Um, so we will often find when we try to do that work of identifying variants of a single variable that there's a subclass within this variable um, where we do have variation, so people will choose between two or three or four forms or structures. And then there will be another subclass where there's no variation at all. People totally avoid a feature or exclusively produce that feature. And a second part of this principle of accountability is that we have to do the work to differentiate between those two kinds of variability. We have to differentiate the variants that are performing in a rule-governed way following the same set of rules and those that are actually uh, exclusively doing one thing and aren't subject to variability. And that's of crucial importance because if we erroneously collapse the variants that are variable uh, with the variants um, that are invariable, then we will tend to get the wrong picture of variability in the variety that we're interested in uh, because that invariable class of variants can overwhelm the variability that is occurring among that smaller group. So part one of the principle of accountability is we can't just focus on the feature that we're interested in. We have to think about our feature as a variant in a range of uh, other variants that constitute a class of variable. And then second, within that variable, we have to understand what the rules are that are governing the different variants within that and make sure that when we compare variants as a class of a variable, that we're truly only exploring things that are following the same sets of rules, the same feature, so that we get the right picture of variability. An example of this prototypically, uh, of, of both sides of this principle, occurs in something like uh, the past tense B paradigm, um, which many dialects undergo some form of leveling. Uh, so for instance, in North American uh, working class dialects and other socially stigmatized dialects, it's very common for past tense B verbs to undergo a leveling to uh, the third person singular form. Uh, so we'll get, uh, the, the, and first person singular as well, so we'll get a, a verbal past tense paradigm of I was, you was, he was, we was, uh, you was, they was. Um, in many British English dialects, we have a parallel form of, of leveling, though in British English is many regional dialects that leveling goes to uh, the were form that it tends to be more associated with uh, plural number nouns and pronouns. Uh, so you may get uh, I were, you were, he, she, it were, uh, they were, you were, we were. Um, traditional dialectology that fails to follow the first part of the principle of accountability might listen to speakers and simply try to determine whether or not uh, speakers use uh, one of the non-standard forms. 
So in this case, we would survey speakers, and if we found that someone used, as we'd expect in British English, leveling toward the plural paradigm of were, then we would count that area as having the non-standard level were uh, in the past tense B paradigm. Uh, so in the case of these Coventrians, uh, William Derrick uh, um, Kent was uh, born in Coventry somewhere around 1927. Uh, Gordon was born in uh, also in Coventry sometime in, in the 1950s. Uh, so we hear these samples uh, of them using the past tense B paradigm. It was a long, long way from uh... the club and the eagle were, was packed. And then on the basis of the, these, particularly with uh, who I have labeled William here, we would conclude uh, he levels to past tense were. Um, Gordon would be a more interesting case because we just in this clip have variability where he initially says were uh, and then corrects to was, so we sociolinguistically see some evidence. But nevertheless, if we're only focusing contra the principle of accountability on the feature that we're interested in and only categorizing the fact that he used were in a non-standard third-person singular agreement context, then we would again count uh, Gordon as having uh, non-standard past tense B leveling. So our first point here uh, is that uh, the principle of accountability raises a challenge because if we're only focusing on the feature of interest then we would hear both these speakers we would recognize that at, in at least one case they use the non-standard past tense were uh, when standard English would prescribe was. We would categorize these speakers and this dialect region as having uh, non-standard past tense be verb leveling to were uh, and characterize the dialect region on the basis of that. And even as Gordon's clip here illustrates, that would clearly underdetermine what's happening with this variable. I'll talk to the second principle uh, now though by looking at uh, a selection of this, the, uh, of Derek Kent's, this is, is William, um, so his real name is William but he went by Derek. Um, this is a selection of his usages of past tense, uh, past tense be verb. And what we see is there are indeed, as we expect from the clip that we just listened to, many non-standard cases. Uh, for instance, uh, and it were just me and the other fellow, it were a long way, the pit were shut. Um, we also see the evidence of the standard be verb paradigm in other plural contexts. So we have, uh, they were no minors now, uh, there were minors, uh, the, the subject in who were awarded at DCM, don't come Mondays, uh, is plural. So we have, we have standard cases. Critically though, if we look to the bottom of this list, we also have uh, many cases of what standard English would prescribe as the be verb paradigm in uh, the past tense uh, forms. So we have that was walking a knife, which was a great puzzle, and it was actually ranked one pit was closed. So we actually even have variability between pit were shut at one point in the interview and uh, pit was closed later on in the interview. So here we have uh, a demonstration of the problem of treating the feature of interest as the totality of our description and missing variability that's occurring within this data set. We also though, on the second point, um, get an illustration of the issue of failing to properly differentiate the variants within a variable that are following the same rules from those that are in variable. So what I'm pointing to here is that uh, while we do see variation in the third person singular paradigm in and it were just me, it were a long way, pit were shut versus which was a great puzzle, it was actually ranked, one pit was closed. We don't see variability in uh, second person or in 
uh, expectedly plural paradigms. So we always have uh, they were no minors, there were no mi there were minors who were awarded. Uh, you were never short uh, of meeting minor, and because this is an invariable set of uh, productions, if we were to compare all of uh, Williams' uh, usage of past tense B and collapse all the instances of was and quantify them against all the instances of were, it would look like he was much more strongly uh, using the past tense were uh, across all contexts uh, and would underdetermine the amount of variability that's actually happening uh, in the third person singular paradigm where he does actually vary between was and were. So what I'm trying to say here uh, to Lebov's second part of the principle of accountability that we need to differentiate within a variable between those portions that are following the same rule and those are invariable is that here if we collapsed all of the person uh, and um, number agreement categories together and looked at how many times overall Derek Kent says was versus how many he says were, it would look like he overwhelmingly almost always used were. However, if we just screen down, get rid of the places where he doesn't vary at all, which is in uh, second person singular and first, second, and third person plural. And then just look at variability in his third person singular and first person singular paradigms, then it's a much more complex picture. And as we see here, uh, I've counted very roughly, there's about 176 times in those contexts that he uses was and 92 that he uses were. And, and, and again, this is, is a quick count, uh, not, not, not print worthy. Um, but it does highlight that all of a sudden there's a much richer picture of variation between these two forms, which becomes really important when we look at variability in the dialect overall, since Gordon, as we heard in the previous clip, has variability and a sociolinguistic judgment that he needs to correct uh, singular agreement to were to was in very rapid succession. So what we have to do here is go through two steps. First, we have to uh, move from the particular feature construction uh, very end that we're interested in and define the entire class of variables uh, and all the variants that occur within uh, that variable and quantify each of those so we can accurately report the overall picture of variability uh, and not just whether or not the feature of interest that we're, occur that we're interested in occurs. Second, we have to differentiate between the variants where there is variability uh, and the variants that are following the same rule in their variation and separate those away from uh, the places where there is no variability. Um, and only if we go through both of those steps can we come up with an accurate picture of linguistic and sociolinguistic variability within a variety, within a dialect, or, or within a language. So once we understand that, what we can do is come up with a general protocol where when we identify a feature that we're interested in studying, our first step is to go through our data set that we've collected as dialectologists or sociolinguists or whatever and determine all the variants that occur within that, uh, that, that are relevant to that feature, that are governed by the same set of rules as that feature. And then treat all those variants that uh, occur, uh, that are actually uh, 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 belong to, to the same variable as, as a class, and we have to quantify the occurrence of each of those variants. Um, that means in some cases uh, reporting uh, a feature that we're not interested in. So when we're interested in a non-standard feature, uh, reporting that, but also reporting the occurrences of the standard feature. Uh, it might also mean reporting times of non-use. So null cases where a speaker could have opted to use that feature, but chose to use uh, none at all.
this is maybe not so easy to demonstrate with the past tense B verb leveling paradigm in the Coventry data, uh, but you can easily demonstrate it in something like the quotative system in English, uh, which has attracted a lot of attention in the last 20 years or so in research for the introduction of the innovation like being used as a quotative. So in the sentence, my friend was like, I really hate this class, um, I introduced something that my friend said um, and and I entail that I'm committing myself to the, the spirit of the quote of, of, of the words I'm attributing to that person but not the literal content so it's 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 known that this is a paraphrase of, of the, the kind of thing that the person meant rather than than verbatim what they said um, and this is very much a dialectological variable. There's a sociolinguistic association with this historically with, uh, with, with Valley Girl speech. So, so uh, white Southern Californian, upper middle class, middle class, uh, young adolescent girls. Um, and this has been traced as a variable that's spread across global Englishes uh, and, and indeed has, has calcs and, and spread into uh, other uh, variations such as dialects of Romanian which have taken na uh, which means like and have transferred this over to perform the same kinds of discourse and quotative functions uh, as, as like does in English. So, so canonically a dialectological variable. Um, but but the, the point here being, uh, there's obvious variability in the quotative system of English between uh, a, a traditional standard quotative like said, so my friend said, I hate this class, versus quotative innovative like, uh, my friend was like, I hate this class. Um, but there's also a null option, so um, a speaker could say, my friend he's, I hate this class, um, and that my friend, he's, I hate this class, uh, would, does not introduce that quotation with any quotative marker, even though potentially for, for demonstration purposes and maybe discourse purposes and maybe do some, some non-linguistic stuff. Um, <clears throat> but, but what that highlights there is that in addition to the overt spoken uh, variants said like among others there's a potential null variant where no quotative is used to introduce the quoted section. So in determining the total class of variables and the number of variants that, that are constituted within that class of variables, we may have to be attentive to null variants that occur that perform that function but aren't actually spoken out loud. I'll flatter myself by talking about some of my own work in the context of the principle of accountability, at least as I see it, uh, and at least as I see it exemplifying the need to follow Lebov's principle of accountability. Um, so a, a, a grammatical variable that I'm interested in right now is need passive constructions. As illustrated on this slide, uh, these are constructions where the verb need uh, takes an embedded passive phrase uh, as in the sentence the car needs to be washed uh, and that um, infinitival to be with the past participle form is the standard way for embedded passive constructions to be formed in English. Uh, traditionally in dialectology there's been interest in an alternative uh, construction where the verb needs takes a past participle as its passive complement. Uh, this is illustrated in the bottom example, the car needs washed. This has also uh, recently uh, been identified by, by Ray Hickey uh, as well as a group uh, working uh, out of Glasgow as uh, features of Northern Irish English in, in Ray Hickey's case uh, and as features of, of Scottish English uh, in, in, in the Glasgow case. Uh, but traditionally, the interest in this variable and, and this variable here, the feature of interest in the context of the principle of, account of accountability is the past participle construction, the car needs washed. The dialectological interest in this historically has been in American Englishes uh, which have associated this past participle construction with the American Midland. So in particular, 
uh, Pittsburgh and then a band uh, following uh, east to west from Pittsburgh, which roughly follows the, 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 the migratory patterns in the 1800s as settlers moved along the Ohio River Valley uh, and then spread out to the west. Um, uh, sort of with a, a limit in, in Missouri and some of the areas uh, at the trailhead of, of the Oregon Trail, Santa Fe Trail, and California. Um, so this is demonstrated here uh, in this map, which is taken from Murray Fraser and Simon's 1996 article in American Speech, uh, which shows uh, respondents to their survey who indicated that they could use this uh, needs plus past participle construction, something like the car needs washed. Um, and this area that they highlight where they, they trace dots uh, in, those indicate numbers of people who responded positively in their questionnaire that they could say it, uh, and that then they draw this isogloss uh, above and, and below these areas, which corresponds roughly to the region that most American dialectologists today refer to as the Midland. Uh, and again, this, this follows roughly the, the Ohio River uh, Valley. Uh, you can see the Ohio River uh, running at the, the southern border of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, uh, and then, then uh, the Missouri uh, boot heel. Um, so, so key point here is that the variability uh, researched has been treating needs plus past participle, as in the car needs washed, as the feature of interest and examining its variability with the presumably standard construction where an infinitival phrase with a past participle, the car needs to be washed, is the standard. So feature of interest, the car needs washed, and looking at variability with the presumed standard feature, the car needs to be washed, uh, and giving us this perspective of the American Midland as a place where the car needs washed is used, uh, and other areas as, as places where it's not said. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, Ray Hickey and a uh, uh, group out of the University of Glasgow have also found this respectively in Northern Ireland uh, and Scotland. A third construction, and, and what I want to highlight here is that previous research has only has not looked at this one, is that that needs can take uh, a gerund form of the verb, as in the sentence "the car needs washing." Uh, this this gerund construction is treated as standard in all Englishes as a prescriptive construction. Uh, so this is sometimes referred to in grammars like uh, Huddleston and Pullum refer to this as the concealed passive. Um, and, and so this was treated as a, a second production uh, and not something in a system of variability with these other two features. So the car needs washing hasn't been of interest at all. Rather, we've just looked uh, in traditional dialectological literature, uh, as well as uh, studies of syntax and microsyntax that have examined this feature. We've only looked at variability between uh, the car needs to be washed and the car needs washed. Um, I looked at variability between these two constructions on Twitter uh, and uh, basically replicated the previous pattern uh, for variability between these two forms on uh, that was previously constructed, uh, for example, in uh, Murray Fraser and Simon on the basis of survey judgments of acceptability. Uh, I found similar results on Twitter. Uh, so on this map of the United States, the high numbers uh, show areas where uh, a phrase like the car needs washed occurs as a higher proportion of uh, all need passive constructions between the car needs to be washed and the car needs washed. Uh, so in other words, um, in a city like uh, Chicago, um, in the, 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 the sort of center of the map uh, just below Michigan uh, and uh, uh, at the top of Illinois, uh, has a two. And what that means is, is proportionally, um, two out of a hundred times when somebody needed to form a need passive construction, uh, two times out of that overall proportion, they chose the car needs washed, and the other 98 times they used the car needs to be washed. So predominantly the car needs washed. By contrast, uh, in cities like Pittsburgh, uh, where the 39 is over on the, the west side of Pennsylvania, um, 
39 times out of 100, uh, when someone produced a need passive construction, they went with the feature of interest, the car needs washed, rather than the car needs to be washed. So this picture, treating these two variables, uh, these two variants as one variable, uh, achieved basically the same picture as uh, earlier research, that this is a construction of the American Midland. Uh, the areas on this map of relatively higher proportions uh, constitute uh, uh, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, uh, Columbus, Indianapolis, St. Louis is the five, and then Kansas City is the 11. These are higher than in, than other places in the United States, and this largely replicates the the map of of acceptability judgments that that Murray and Fraser Simon had drawn uh, along the Ohio River Valley following that that migration settlement pattern, which corresponds to the American Midland. But to be true to the principle of accountability, what I have to do is remind us that there's this third construction, the car needs washing, that has not been previously considered as variable within this class. We've just assumed that it was standard. And if we bring in a quantification of this variant, then we get a very different picture. So on this chart, uh, what I've done is I've taken 50 varieties of English taken from, uh, from, from global Englishes around the world. 20 of these are North American varieties, um, actually 22 uh, as, as, uh, at, the, at the North American uh, label. We count uh, Toronto and Vancouver, Canada. Uh, 17 are UK varieties, and the remainder are varieties of, of, uh, of uh, outer circle Englishes uh, and, and other inner circle Englishes like uh, uh, Sydney, Auckland, uh, and Dublin. Um, and this now shows proportions of all three need passive constructions uh, being as, as proportions of, of a three member variable rather than just a set of needs to be washed uh, and needs washed. So now we have three way proportions between uh, the car needs to be washed, the car needs washing, and the car needs washed. Um, and of course, the, the green bar. Uh, which shows the variable that other that, that dialectology has traditionally treated as being relevant and of interest uh, shows the sort of picture of variability that we would expect on the basis of previous studies. Uh, areas like Belfast, Glasgow, and Edinburgh have a relatively high proportion of uh, the car needs washed to the car needs to be washed. Uh, and then cities in the American Midland, like Pittsburgh, Columbus, Indianapolis, uh, Cleveland not so much but not important here, Kansas City also relative to other cities have high proportions uh, of the uh, past participle construction the car needs washed um, relative to other global Englishes though they, the American cities don't quite get to the level of uh, Belfast, Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, so this confirms what we already expected to see on the basis of just looking at these two variables. But what happens when we add in the third variant that has previously been ignored because it was simply presupposed that it was a standard feature, um, is that over on the right side, we actually see the same kind of proportional change happening um, as need need with the gerund, the car needs washing, starts to displace uh, the standard the car needs to be washed as the preferred need passive construction. And at the farthest end of this, uh, we see cities like uh, Manchester, Leeds, and Liverpool, where the gerund construction, the car needs washing, actually replaces the car needs to be washed as the preferred embedded need passive construction. And of crucial interest, once we look at the cities that are listed on this side of the diagram where the gerund form occurs more uh, with increasing frequency as a proportion of need passive constructions, these are all uh, British cities and specifically with the exception of Cardiff, they're all English cities. Um, and uh, strikingly, the pattern of need ing on the right side of the chart in, in the red cities uh, that are England and Wales is a mirror image of the green cities on the left of the chart 
uh, where need ed, the car needs washed, the participle construction is the preferred form. So actually, the regional variability of this feature suggests that there are two uh, regional variables here. The one that everybody has studied and been interested in uh, as the feature of interest, the car needs washed, is indeed a regional grammatical feature associated with Northern Ireland, Scotland, and the U.S. Midland. Um, but also the feature that was presumed to be a global English standard is itself also a regional grammatical feature and it's associated with England and Wales. Um, and, and, and slightly more generally uh, Britain because, because uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh and Ab Aberdeen do have elevated uh, versions of this as well. And almost everywhere else in the world, and, and in particular in North America, but also in uh, uh, Islamabad, New Delhi, and Cape Town, um, proportions of the need gerund construction, the car needs washing, occur very, very infrequently. So it's not accurate to say that this is really a, a, a standard variable in these varieties in the way that it's uh, a, 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 a variable that, that uh, occurs as a, a very high density of need passive constructions in England and Wales. Um, so in terms of the principle of accountability, what's happened here is, I argue, linguists have failed uh, to accurately uh, capture all three of the variants that occur within this variable. So linguists, dialectologists specifically, but linguists more generally, have treated need passive variation historically as a feature of interest. We were interested in whether or not an area could use the need with past participle construction, as in the car needs washed. Actually, it's a variable that consists of three variants. The presumed standard uh, infinitive with a past participle is in the car needs to be washed. It's a regional variant that's particularly associated with a couple of regions of global Englishes, the need with past participle, the car needs washed. But there's a third variant that was previously just presupposed to be standard, uh, need with a gerund, the car needs washing, and that actually that is a regional variable just as much as uh, the one that we've always treated as variable. So by focusing on a feature of interest and looking at that as the exclusive domain of variability and looking at that as a question of whether or not that feature occurred in areas, we've actually mischaracterized the variability within the system of need passive constructions and as a result uh, failed to identify a regional grammatical variable in the case of uh, need with a gerund. We've uh, incorrectly, in many grammars, including the Cambridge Grammar of English, uh, characterized a uh, regional feature as uh, a standard feature that's standard and equally standard across global Englishes. Uh, that has important consequences theoretically because uh, those standard grammars are, are fundamental to the way that English teaching texts uh, and English as a foreign language texts are constructed. They use uh, those grammars as references. So a grammatical feature is being taught as a standard feature. And uh, syntactic accounts of uh, how the grammar of embedded passives uh, work that have been based on this treatment of, uh, of needs with a past participle being the only variant uh, of an otherwise standard uh, to be plus past participles in the car needs to be washed, uh, have mischaracterized the syntactic variability of the system uh, and, and mischaracterized the syntax of embedded passives in uh, English. So the result is, uh, because we focused on a feature of interest and whether or not that occurred, failed to uh, encapsulate, I argue, the totality of all the variants that are a member of that set of variables. We've described the variable incorrectly and described grammar uh, in the context of that variable incorrectly. Um, so for me, this is a demonstration of the importance of keeping the principle of accountability in mind, 
uh, and focusing and challenging whether or not we've properly differentiated all the members of a variable, all the variants that belong in a variable and are following the same rules, uh, and quantifying the occurrence of each variant within that set of variables to capture the entire picture of variability. So when we summarize, the principle of accountability says that we must account for every instance where a variable occurs, and we must account for, crucially, every instance where the variable could occur. And add on to this, we have to differentiate between the members of that variable set that are subject to the same rules and therefore are really varying in comparable ways and separate those out from the members that are invariable. Um, and, and this is crucial work to dialectology, to sociolinguistics, to variation of sociolinguistics, and to linguistics in general to properly account for the variability that occurs in the uh, linguistic features that we're interested in. Now, importantly, with the principle of accountability as fundamental to us, we need to interrogate the extent to which we apply the principle of accountability across different domains of linguistic analysis and different domains of dialectology. And it will be fundamentally the fact that different domains, different types of variables will um, have different consequences for how we apply the principle of accountability. So for instance, in the phonetic and phonological domain, there's a fairly straightforward way to apply the principle of accountability. You typically, if you've collected a sociolinguistic interview and are basing a dialectological study on that, you transcribe the entire interview and then you uh, code each time when uh, a variant of the variable that we're interested in occurs um, and, and code all those possible instances and then for each of those instances uh, 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 account for uh, what actually was produced in that case. So if we're interested in uh, T deletion in consonant clusters, we would go through our transcript that we've created and identify every time when there is a consonant cluster and then go back through the speech sample and uh, for each of those times we identified um, code whether or not the consonant occurred. Um, if we're doing acoustic analyses, then the standard practice is to, uh, or the emerging practice is to measure each occurrence of, for instance, the vowel that we're interested in if we're studying uh, whether or not speakers say foot and strut the same way. In those cases, we'd be interested in how speakers say strut. And so we'd measure each occurrence of strut uh, every time the strut vowel was used during uh, the, the, the interview or the data set that we're interested in, and measure each of those and compare all those to their acoustic productions of the foot vowel. That way we would encompass the entire set of potential variability uh, times when they said strut uh, so that it sounded acoustically like foot uh, and, and what we might find in other cases times when they said strut in a way more like strut or perhaps more like thought or, or something else within the system. Um, Similarly, in a morphosyntactic domain, if we're looking at something like uh, multiple negation, uh, we can go through a transcript of an interview and identify each time the sentence the, the speaker used negation. So we could identify each time uh, where there was a negative particle early in a clause and then identify whether there were additional markers of negation after that. So that's not too difficult. Um, by contrast, we can consider something like the semantic pragmatic domain, where this might be much more difficult. Um, so one of the most interesting dialectological and sociolinguistic variables uh, in recent English is, is the discourse particle like. Now I've already mentioned this as a variable of interest in the quotative system, but of course there's another occurrence of like where it functions more as uh, perhaps a topicalizer or a floor holder. So if a speaker is saying like something uh, like I didn't know exactly what they were talking about, but like they needed to kind of hold the like hold the floor a little bit longer. Like can have much more complicated functions in that case, uh, where it 
it, it could be in those cases working as it says a topicalizer. It could be a floor holder. It could also be doing quoted, quotative work uh, or quantifier work to to express that that uh, a quantity that they're interested in uh, was was sort of this number, but 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 not necessarily exactly this number. But what I highlight in that uh, is that those topicalizer floor holder kind of usages are really optional. So a speaker in a given passage could choose to say, I think like I was there for a while, or they could say, I think I was there for a while. And it's a very difficult, uh, it's a much higher burden to apply the principle of accountability in that latter case when the speaker had the option to use the feature that we're interested in and the member of that variable class but but just didn't choose to um, but also wasn't strictly speaking under an obligation to make that choice or not in other words the topic that they're talking about the strategies that they're enacting as a as as a discourse user um, may or may not have caused them to feel like they needed to choose between saying like or not. So in those cases, especially in the realm, I would argue, of semantic and pragmatics uh, and, and of course more generally, we often get into spaces where we need to apply the principle of accountability, but we need to come up with a way to do that uh, in the absence of a speaker being forced and us being able objectively to know a speaker had to make that decision or not. So what I'd posit is that there are roughly four levels, particularly in the domain of grammatical variables, but this will also very much apply to the domains of semantic and pragmatic uh, variables, um, and, and less so, though maybe not, a, maybe some, uh, in, in domains of, of phonetic, phonological, and morphological variables. Um, I'll posit that there's about four different types of variable uh, with regard to the principle of accountability. The first of these uh, is, is, is variables that are absolutely predictable. These are cases where we can know objectively that a speaker must have been forced to choose one variant or another. Um, the, in English, the third person inflection paradigm uh, is, is a canonical case of this uh, in the verbal system. So English, of course, requires uh, only third person singular verbs to agree with, uh, or, uh, or excuse me, requires agreement uh, between verbs and their subjects only in the case of third person singular verbs. Uh, so standard English requires uh, I run, you run, we run, you run, they run, but he, she, it runs where inflection on the verb marks agreement between the verb and its third person singular subject. This is a site of predictable variability because we know that uh, the requirement is there in the sense that we know when a third person singular subject has occurred and when there's a verb. And so we know any time that there's a third person sub singular subject and a verb that we can check that verb for whether it's been marked uh, for agreement by uh, an inflectional morpheme. So it's very easy to say, uh, did that person say she run or she runs? There's predictable variability in that case. Um, a slightly more complex set uh, is where we have predictable variants uh, and we can encapsulate these as a set of variants, uh, but that they, they might differ in sort of more complex ways in their surface level forms. Um, the quotative system is a good example of this that I mentioned earlier, uh, and the quotative system is, is much more complex than what I suggested uh, when I just mentioned said, like, and null as options. Uh, speakers can use go as a quotative, uh, speakers can use all as a quotative, so he goes, I really hate this class, he's all, I really hate this class, as I suggested earlier, he says, I really hate this class. He's like, I really hate this class. He, I really hate this class. Um, 
so, so the, the, there, there are many options available, um, and and this this next level of grammatical variable and, and variable more generally, uh, there is a set of variants that differ in their surface level form, uh, but we can can still make predictions about what we'll see and then encapsulate this set of different forms as a single variable. Um, the addition to this, and I, I sort of mentioned, I, I did mention null as a possibility, um, but but a, a sort of expand uh, encapsulable as a set of vari variants uh, to encapsul encapsulable as a set of variants with at least one of those variants being null. Uh, so again, I mentioned the quotative system here, relativizers, uh, for instance, variability in English dialects um, in choosing uh, as a relativizer that versus which versus null. Um, uh, so uh, the book that I read, the book which I read, the book I read. Uh, this is subject to variability in different dialects of English, uh, British Englishes. Um, in this case, would would have a higher preference for which American Englishes would have a higher preference for that, um, and and different speakers and and there are differences regionally and across time in in uses of the null variable. So these are also encapsulable as a group. Um, but we have to remember that there's the possibility of a null realization where no form is actually spoken on the surface uh, as, as being a member of that class. And then finally and most complicatedly, uh, there are uh, variables with unpredictable distributions. Um, so this could uh, uh, include variables that, that I talk about periodically in the context of dialectology, like uh, how speakers use the adverb anymore. Uh, so there's regional variability in whether or not people can say a phrase like, there's a lot to do downtown anymore. Um, but it's difficult to, uh, in a natural stretch of speech, quantify usages of that positive anymore because uh, there's never an obligation in a stretch of discourse for a person to say anymore. So in the same way that, that it's just sort of happenstance if we see the, the, the standard version of that in something like there's nothing to do downtown anymore. It just happens to be a consequence of discourse and what the speaker was talking about that they used anymore uh, in, in that standard usage. Uh, it's also the case that uh, it's just kind of a consequence of happenstance and, and that, that that's where the conversation took them if a speaker naturally says uh, there's a lot to do downtown anymore. Um, the, the, this, uh, another fun example of this, uh, during uh, the height of Friends popularity as a TV show, there was linguistic interest in intensifiers that emerged from that show. Uh, so, so. <laughs> So is the one I'm interested in, uh, but he's so totally late. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so not going there. Um, so is always optional as an intensifier, um, and so we can categorize what happens when it's used, uh, but it's a much more complex system to look through a stretch of discourse and determine a speaker could have chosen to use an intensifier in this uh, uh position and in this stretch of discourse uh, and chose to use some other intensifier besides so or chose not to use an intensifier at all or perhaps used an intensification strategy like an increase in pitch uh, or, or non-linguistic gestures of face or, or, or bodily movement. So this is a more, much more complex space. Nevertheless, even though it's a complex space, we still have to follow the principle of accountability because if we don't, then uh, as, as I've said throughout, we're failing to encapsulate and failing to represent the linguistic variability that occurs. So with awareness of the principle of accountability and the fundamental principle that uh, we, we, when looking at a feature of interest, we can't just look at whether or not that feature of interest occurs. We have to understand that feature of interest as a variant uh, in a set of variables and properly delineate what that variable is. Um, 
in which members of that variable are subject to the same set of variability rules and constraints uh, and then quantify all the variation within that set and that only if we do that uh, can we properly account for and describe the linguistic variation in a dialect, in a variety, in a language. Um, with that understood as a fundamental principle of the work that we do, then we can understand the different variables that we're working with as dialectologists, sociolinguists, variationists, and linguists, and think metacritically and strategically about uh, how they interact with the principle of accountability, whether uh, their occurrence is predictable, whether their occurrence is encapsulable as a set of variants, whether it's encapsulable as a set of variants, but there also might be null realizations that we have to realize uh, and account for, or if their occurrence is unpredictable and we have to come up with some kind of a strategy, some kind of a principled reason, uh, and some kind of a principled way to still follow the principle of accountability, um, then at least we can go in the right directions to accounting for all the variation that occurs relative to that feature that we actually started out being interested in. Uh, and, and in doing so, we can come closer to accurate descriptions of linguistic variability within a variety, within a dialect, and within a language uh, as, as we're required to do as good dialectologists uh, and as good linguists.